Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is part three for our Zoom recorded lecture for the topic promissory estoppel. So in the first two parts, we uh, we covered the introduction. Okay, we covered also all the features up to features number five. Now this is the final feature, which is a uh, sixth feature, which is it must be unfair or unjust okay, for the promisor to go back on his promise. And it is unjust for him to insist on his strict legal rights. So in other words here, the promisor, okay, once he made, when he makes the promise, is not allowed to retract. It's not allowed to go back on his promise because why? It will be unfair okay, or unjust to do so. Unfair on whom? On the other party, on the part of the promisee. Let's have a look at the case here. The case is Teh Pohua and Suramban Securities Senumrahat 1996. It involves appell this is appeal case, appellant and respondent. So appellant's husband actually had a Mareva injunction imposed against him. This is injunction, a court's order to freeze all the uh, property belonging to the husband. So the husband cannot have any dealing, cannot open um, uh, a bank account, for example. Okay. So in order for the husband to be able to deal in stocks, uh, in shares, the appellant proceeded, the wife basically, okay, proceeded to open a bank account with a checkbook, signed all the checks in blank, and the wife handed the whole checkbook to the husband. And um, the husband actually later entered into a written contract with a stockbroking firm, uh, the respondent using the, the wife's name, eh, the appellant's name. And all the husband's share transactions were done in the appellant's name uh, as it was her name. Okay, meaning, yeah, the wife's name will appear on all the contract, okay, on all the document. And the share account with the respondent actually later had problem. It went bad. Okay, so respondent sued the the appellant cannot sue the husband. Obviously, the name of the appellant appeared on the document. Respondent now sued appellant for the money's due. Okay, all the overdue uh, payment here. And um, actually, the wife denied the liability. He said no, it wasn't me. It was my husband basically. And uh, the court held that the appeal could be satisfactorily resolved okay, by reference to the doctrine of estoppel. I Meaning here, the wife is now estopped from claiming he's not the, she's not the one who was involved. Because why? Through her actions, uh, the wife, the appellant would have led a reasonable man to believe that she had given her husband a full discretionary power, carte blanche, okay, to act on her behalf. So it will be unjust, it will be unequitable to allow the wife, the appellant, to assert facts okay, that will now contrad contradict her earlier conduct. Okay? You agreed to let husband do it on your behalf, so you cannot really deny that later you are being estopped. So it was no answer for the appellant to say that he had, she had not actually authorised the husband to enter into the contract using her name. So it's too late to deny okay, here. Okay, now we go to the scope. Okay, just now we were talking about the features, the scope. So what is the scope of doctrine? Is it a shield, okay, the function basically, or is it a sword? Okay, a shield refers to a cause of action. A sword is a defense. Okay, you are defending using a sword, like I said. Okay, so the rule is that a stopper is a shield and it's not a sword. So uh, it. Estoppel cannot be used as, um, as the basis of an action on its own. You cannot file a cause of action based on estoppel alone. Okay? Because most of the time, estoppel is a defense, to defense the case. Okay? So, promissory estoppel, basically, it does not create new causes of action wherever, when there's none existed before. So, it is a defense and estoppel is not a cause of action. Let's have a look at the case of Com and Com reported in year 1951. The, the case also relates to consideration. Husband and uh, upon divorce, okay, the husband promised the wife 100 pounds a year. And this is considered as permanent allowance. And in reliance upon this promise, the wife forbore, okay, I mean forego. Okay, um, I mean the, the wife did not proceed to apply to the courts for maintenance because husband already promised to pay. Okay. But the husband failed to make the payments as he promised. And now the wife sued the husband based on the promise. And the wife argued that the, the ex-husband okay, legally had to pay money to her okay, because he promised to do so. And the wife argued promissory estoppel. But Court of Appeal held that 
uh, when we look at the consideration, okay, there was no consideration for the promise as the wife forbearance had not been requested. This is in relation to the rule of forbearance, okay, to sue. And uh, it was not in return for the promise made to her. And also, the wife cannot rely on the promissory estoppel because it does not give rise to a cause of action. It will be different if the wife is being sued by the husband and the wife uses estoppel as a defense to the action by the, by the plaintiff. Okay? But in this case, the wife started the case based on estoppel. So it shouldn't work that way. Okay? It doesn't operate uh, that way okay? uh, for estoppel. And uh, Lord Danny, yeah, Danny LJ here, he said that promissory estoppel apply only to variations or discharges of existing contract. And it doesn't create new contract. And this is actually very, very important limitation of estoppel. Otherwise, it will affect all the rules pertaining to consideration. Okay? So it, it was made clear, okay, promissory estoppel is available only where there has been alteration, okay, variation to the existing contract. And it cannot be used to render unnecessary consideration on the formation of contract. It doesn't affect the normal rule governing contract law. I mean, yeah, there must be consideration between the parties involved here. Okay, okay another uh, question for us to address is, okay, uh, is promissory estoppel available for the plaintiff? Because now, just now we discussed about it is uh, to be used as a defense, not a cause of action. Okay. It depends actually the answer to this question. Okay, where a plaintiff cause of action is met by defendant's defense and counterclaim, okay, yes, it is also available for the, the plaintiff okay, to use as support to defend. Again, okay, the, the function is defend the scope, a defense to defendant's counterclaim. So it doesn't matter whether plaintiff or defendant, so long the scope is to defend, okay, to defend counterclaim, right? And we discussed already the case of Cheng Hangguan and Perumahan Pralim in the earlier part of the uh, lecture. Okay? And in this case, in Cheng Hangguan, okay, plaintiff may rely on estoppel if he has independent cause of action. Um, uh, estoppel may be part of cause of action, okay, but not a cause of action. Is mean that here, if he has a number of cause of action, yes, he can use estoppel. But not estoppel cannot stand as the only part of uh, the only cause of action. Okay. And then another scope of estoppel is that, okay, basically we look at the effect, okay, whether promissory estoppel here, is it extinctive, okay, uh, or is it suspensory? As they mean here, it, does it extinguish, put an end to all the contractual obligation, or is it, is it um, just merely to suspend certain rights, okay, which is due, okay, which is, uh, I mean, on which on the part of the promiso towards the promisee. So basically, the answer is that estoppel does not extinguish rights. Okay? It only operates, it only serves okay, to suspend and not wholly to extinguish the existing obligation. So that's why the promiso actually may, it's possible okay, for the promiso to give due reasonable notice to resume the rights okay, which has been waived and promisor can revert okay, to the original terms of the contract. But during the suspension of the rights, then promisor cannot insist on the right. But after some time, give reasonable notice, then yes, they can go back to the earlier part of their contractual obligation. For example, if we go to refer to high trees again, okay, really look at high trees, uh, plaintiff, uh, the, uh, the lessor, okay, the lessor was able to restore payment of full rent, okay, although whatever in the past, okay, uh, the rent was lost, nah, he, they were stopped, okay, but from starting from early 1945 onwards, okay, they could have restored the full rent, okay, provided they have to give um, reasonable or due notice to the other party, to the lessee, that they say, okay, we are going to collect a full rent again okay, because now the flats were already fully occupied okay, after the war. Okay, and in relation to notice just now, we have the term like due notice, reasonable notice, sufficient notice. So what amounts to sufficient notice okay, to terminate the suspension of the legal rights here? It is very subjective in nature actually. We have the case of Tool Metal Manufacturing Company Limited and Tungsten Electric Company Limited. This is common law, 1955. This is the facts, okay? In year 1938, 
This is appeal case. Appellant granted to respondent a license. Okay, license to do what? To import, to make, to use and sell certain hard metal alloys. Uh, in, uh, it had patent, patented. Um, and respondent, okay, what's the obligation of respondent? Was respondent was to pay royalties. Okay? And then if the amount of material made exceeded a name quota, certain limitation, so a respondent was to be was to pay compensation. And then uh, because of the war, again, uh, the, the, I mean, uh, this case, it involved a war during the war. So on the outbreak of war, First World War, World War One, okay. The, the appellant agreed to suspend its rights to compensation. Okay, no need to pay compensation. Okay, you just, you just pay me royalties, okay. And then both of them, now the parties contemplating, they have in their mind, okay, that maybe they might sign a new agreement later after the war ended, okay. In, in 1945, after the war, actually, the appellant claimed to have revoked its suspension. Okay, and now they wanted to claim for compensation. They are claiming for both like, royalties and compensation because during the war, they said no need to pay compensation. Okay, but the, this claim failed. What's the reason? On the ground that the revocation was premature because why? No adequate notice had been given to the respondent. If you wanted to claim for resume payment for compensation, must give adequate, sufficient notice. So in 1950, okay, uh, five years later, the appellant brought the present action, okay, claiming compensation from first year in 1947, uh, at which date actually by this date, respondent was fully aware okay, that the, the appellant was determined to revert to the original agreement. Okay? And the House of Lord held that, yes, okay, the appellant had effectively revoked its promise to suspend. I mean, here, the suspension is no longer effective because it's just merely suspensory, remember, okay? So it's legal right and that it was entitled to the compensation. So equitable principle enunciated uh, in Hughes and Metropolitan Railway was applicable to the situation. Uh, so promiser might, okay, on giving adequate notice to the promisee, yes, promiser has the right to resume its right under the original agreement. So under the original agreement, they are entitled to be paid uh, royalties together with Compensation, but during the war, they waived their rights. Okay, they suspend their rights over the compensation. But later, they wanted to resume the right for the compensation. Yes, it, they can do so. Actually, they have the right to do so. Okay, another question. Okay, is it possible for the estoppel to have permanent effects? Is can it operates um for forever? Okay, infinitely. Okay, for infinity. So actually, yes, it is a waiver. Remember, on the part of the promiser, it depends on the promiser. Okay? So if the promise is such as unequivocally, very clear to indicate the intention of the promiser wholly to abandon or right to payment, so there's no reason for the court uh, to deny such right. It's possible. Okay, There's no reason why a stopper should not be held to have permanent effect. But most of the time, okay, it was promiser who wanted to um, resume okay, whatever earlier... Uh, rights okay, that they suspend for certain time. Okay? If they wanted to abandon their rights forever, then no problem. Okay? Estoppel can have permanent effects. We have the case of Sim Siok Ng and Government of Malaysia reported in 1978. It involved contractor here and also uh, government. Okay? Appellant was a local contractor. Um, Appellant entered into, into a contract with the govern, government of Malaysia uh, pertaining to a tender of construction. They signed a contract. And after they signed the contract, Appellant, the contractor, discovered okay, that his office had made a serious error of calculation. It involved a big amount of money. Okay, one, one, uh, one million plus here. Okay, 1.3 million. Because of that, okay, because of this miscalculation, okay, appellant found difficulty in obtaining building materials to complete the work because now they have problem with the budget, okay, insufficient budget. So because of that, appellants went to see the director of public works department of Sarawak. Okay, and as a result, the respondent, they had oral agreement, oral arrangement, okay, respondent or orally agreed to supply the appellant with certain building materials. Okay? And then the cost will be deducted from the payment due to the appellant. So from then on, okay, whenever the appellant contractor need, needed, okay, wanted the building material, they just write to the divisional engineer because they, there was oral arrangement between them that they will supply okay, whatever building materials. 
But after some time, okay, they had problem. Okay, no building materials were supplied. Okay, uh, because there was seizure of plywood by uh, anti-corruption agency. And because of that, the contractor cannot proceed with the work. Consequently, appellants stop their work. And after uh, the contractor, since your anger, stopped his work, his contract was terminated. On the understanding that following the October, they have meeting, okay, October meeting, he was relieved from supplying the materials and the contract was buried. Okay? And uh, in relation to estoppel, okay, our discussion here, the important thing is that he rely on the promise okay, or assurance given by respondent. And actually, he altered his position according because he thought he will be um, he will be uh, getting, obtaining, obtaining the, the supply of the material, okay? All right, and application, uh, observation here, relying on the promise or assurance given by appellant, okay, uh, given, appellant had altered his position and his responsibilities to supply those materials had been suspended, okay? And then, if the respondent, uh, government of Malaysia, the one who gave the, con the, the, the tender okay, to reimpose contractual obligation uh, provision, they must be they must give adequate notice. Okay? Otherwise, I mean, um, the estoppel is still effective. So, the court said that by whatever name the promise was called, even though it wasn't really termed, they, they, didn't, use the, they didn't use the word promise to estoppel expressly. Okay? concession or temporary arrangement, okay, it was binding on respondent. Okay? But again, it's not uh, to have permanent effect here. It was terminable, can be terminated by respondent giving reasonable notice. So we have the word reasonable notice, adequate notice, sufficient notice, okay, due notice, but it is possible to, okay, to put a stop to the a stop what. It was just mere suspensory in nature. Okay, that's the end of our lecture for the topic promissory estoppel. So I stop sharing. Assalamualaikum.